Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for coming to join us here in the Literary Translation Center. It's really nice to see this many people gather around for the cause of translation. We're here today to talk about translating bestsellers. And when I say that, I don't necessarily mean Fifty Shades of Grey and the worldwide phenomena that take everyone by surprise. I mean the idea of taking a book that was very successful in one or more languages and trying to bring it into your language as a translator. So all of the translators gathered here today have had some experience with that subject and also have some uh, authority to speak to the idea of translating a bestseller. And I want to hear today, and I think you might also be interested in, what are the, the sort of frameworks that a translator uses to consider that concept. They get a call from an editor or they get started in the field. They're not quite sure what kinds of projects to seek, what kinds of books to do samples for. Uh, and I just wonder, where does the concept of success in an initial language come into the picture? And how does that impact the work? So I've gathered some really interesting folks on the panel here today. At the far end, we have John W. Baker. He's a translator from the Greek, and he also speaks, uh, from the Turkish, sorry, and he also speaks Greek and French fluently. Uh, he lived in Turkey for a very long time and has recently returned to London. And he is the translator of Aisha Cullen's Last Train to Istanbul, which has been a phenomenon in a number of languages and will be published in uh, the US and the UK in the fall 2014. Sorry, fall 2013, upcoming fall. Uh, next to him, we have Esther Allen, who I bet all of you already know. Uh, she is one of the doyens of translation in English, and uh, she, I hope, will bring us a little bit of insight to the educator's perspective as someone who spends a lot of time with the younger generation and trying to encourage the younger generation to learn languages and then learn to use them in translation. I think she might have some insight we will be interested in. And to her left, we have Pamela Carmel, who recently translated Apocalypse Z by Manel Lorero, which was a Spanish bestseller and which shot to the top of the bestseller list in the US recently when we published the book with Amazon Crossing. Uh, she also has translated quite a few less successful books and uh, also books that were successful at home and that have been received with interesting uh, responses in English. So she's, she's also focused on Cuban writers, which is an interesting perspective to me as well from such, such a small country. And then we have Jamie Bullock, who is a German to English translator who recently with his wife, uh, Katerina Bleiberg, uh, translated Daniel Glatower's Love Virtually, which is a really fun epistolary love story between two strangers by email. Uh, kind of an interesting quirk to the translator's task. And uh, is also working now on Timur Vermez's comic novel about Hitler that I bet you've all heard of or seen the magnificent cover for. And then finally, uh, to my right is Daniel Hahn, who I bet most of you know. Uh, he is the National Program Director of the British Center for Literary Translation. And I, on the way here, read his The Time in Between by Maria Duenas translation, and I thought it was absolutely beautiful and couldn't put it down. Uh, and one of the most interesting things I noted about reading your translation is that that book did not feel like it would be a bestseller in English while I was reading it, and yet it was. Uh, it's uplifting, and it's not an easy read. It requires something of the reader, and it's a real uh, adventure for the spirit. So it's, it's an interesting group of translators and a very vast range of books that were thinking of in this conversation today. And now I want to turn it over to my translators uh, to start, get us started thinking about where does the idea of sales fit into the translator's perspective? Anybody want to jump in? In the last panel, they were talking about books that had already had great sales in the original language. And I know that that was part of the decision to take on this book, but I don't think it was the only reason. I think this trilogy, it's actually a trilogy, has a lot of appeal on its own. So sales were part of that. Well, oh <laughs> everybody can hear you in the hall. I've got a nice sonorous voice. I Hello? Hello? Yeah, OK. Ayşe Kulin is a very, very popular, best-selling writer in Turkey. And it's an amazing situation because every book she writes goes to the top three best-selling novels. So when she approached me to translate her book, uh, I felt that all I had to do was to translate 
and in essence give what she has been giving to the Turkish public, making, making it uh, an easy read and uh, hopefully uh, capture the essence of what she is all about. And uh, my age and her age is more or less the same, so we speak more or less the same Turkish. I have to explain that in Turkey, uh, the language is being modernized all the time. So, whereas in the past, people my age would speak, speak a lot of, use a lot of Arabic and Farsi words, they are eliminating them now as much as possible, which makes it, as far as I'm concerned, more difficult to translate as beautifully and accurately as I could with her, which is, the, you know, the 50s Turkish. And uh, she said to me, for God's sake, John, when you translate it, don't, I don't want it to read like a translation. I don't even want it to smell as a translation. Do your best. And I did my best. And uh, after I gave her the translation, she, uh, she had a press conference and she talked about my book and about my translation. And she said, John Baker, has not translated the book, he has written it as if he had it was written for the first time in English. And that brought tears to my eyes. I thought that is a most wonderful um, compliment and that is what translators have to aim for, to give to the foreign audience uh, the same thing that the author gives in her own language. And if I can just add a footnote to that, um, it is also important to think about, the, in addition to the beauties of a translation, it is important for translators to think about sales. Um, because I can think of one anecdote that I've been assured is not apocryphal, although I don't know the parties personally, where a translator uh, chose was hired to translate Like Water for Chocolate, uh, the, the book that was at the top of the bestseller list for more than a year in the United States and it generated huge amounts of money. And the translator did not personally find this book to be very much to their taste. They thought it was a bit trivial. And so they were offered a choice between a royalty and a slightly higher advance. And they went with the slightly higher advance because they couldn't imagine that the book would actually do that well. Um, and they are still really writhing <laughs> at what might have been. So I do think as a translator of books that are in that very, very commercial domain, you have to be aware of the possibility that a book could sell very well and ask for that stake in the book that publishers will give you um, if you if you show that you really consider yourself to be a stakeholder and you demand that stake. Hello. If I can, I'm glad I wasn't the first one to strike a venal note into this discussion. <laughs> but there is, um, certainly for British translators, a financial incentive there. Uh, it's quite a minor one. I mean, you have to be looking at very large sales before you earn out your advance, given the royalty which exists as a percent or half a percent, depending on whether the book's hardback or paperback. Um, and this doesn't always exist for some of our European colleagues. I don't know whether you've come across this, but I was recently at a... <clears throat> at a very interesting week in Germany where I was speaking to several translators who are all translating the same book that I am. And very few of them actually get any royalty whatsoever. It's a flat fee. So for them, this same incentive does not exist. But certainly for us here, um, you want to get behind the book and make it work. You, yes, because you... I mean, it's always going to be a gamble and you always assume you're not going to get any money, but you never know because one day it might happen. There's someone... There's a translator who... Uh, might be in this room, she was here earlier, who posted on Facebook yesterday, I got my first royalty check today. And you can tell all of her, all, every other translator on Facebook simultaneously went, I'm sorry, you got a what? <laughs> we all have royalty clauses, uh, certainly in the UK and to some extent in the US. Um, though it's, a, it's often a symbolic thing, as, as Esther said, it's about acknowledging our stake in it. But of course we never know what's going to be a, a bestseller, otherwise um, we'd be 
making more money than we are now. Um, but one of the reasons we don't know is because the fact that something is a bestseller in Spain does not in any way guarantee that it's going to be a bestseller anywhere else. What a lot of publishers will be interested in, however, is if something which is a Spanish book is not only a bestseller in Spain, but has traveled and has sold really well in Germany and in Sweden and in Poland and wherever. So the idea that the book is not only potentially a popular book, but also has the capacity to reach an audience which is not just a domestic audience. That was actually the case with Apocalypse Z. It was already started, the translation was already begun in uh, Italian when I started the English one. And, and it was doing well. It was doing very well in Italy. So I think Amazon, this is an Amazon crossing publication. I, I think they had an idea that it was going to go. I'm curious about the writing as a measure for whether the book will translate. Um, I like the idea of thinking about traveling to multiple languages, and as a translator, that is something that you could consider. I'm curious if there is a, a germ in the original that you can read for as well, uh, or that rings familiar to your ear. I really liked uh, the idea of you know, rewriting it in your language as the, the ultimate compliment. Uh, the, the idea of making it an easy read and having the, the reader not necessarily know that it's a translation. Is there something that a translator can teach themselves to, to try to understand that when they're reading? I'm an editor, so it's my job to pretend I can do that. Can you repeat the question, please? <laughs> if you were to read a, a Turkish novel, could you gauge from the writing whether the translation would flow as though written in, in English and become an easy read that captivates the English reader? Is there, is there something in the raw material of the writing? I think that the fact that it has already traveled is a very clear data point, and I'm just curious, as seasoned translators, if you feel that you've honed the ear. Well, I personally believe that um, a translator, for a start, has to speak the language he is translating for, from, as well as the language he is translating to. And um, I've come across a number of situations which I won't go into, but a very good example is there's a... a, a, a when, I, when Aisha Kulin asked me to translate her book, she didn't interview me, she asked me how do you translate the word kuzum? And I thought it's a very strange question. Kuzum is literally translated my lamb. But depending on the speaker, it can mean darling, um, love, um, uh, my cutie, my baby, my darling, anything, depending on the speaker. And she is not alone. I was reading an article recently uh, Gustave Flaubert, who wrote Madame Bovary, a uh, lot of translations has been, uh, have been made in the past hundred years, over a hundred years, and Mon Petit Chat, My Little Cat, also has been translated in umpteen ways, depending on the translator's perception of the word. So, uh, what I'm trying to say is, the important thing is to be able to, if you speak the language and you know exactly what the author is talking about, to be able to give exactly the same thing, even if you are not translating it literally, to give a word that will give exactly the same effect, the same feeling to the foreign audience. I'm curious. Oh, do you want to jump in? I was just going to say, um, it's a zombie book. There are, <laughs> there. I mean, it's a trilogy, and there are. Um, I, I really didn't know anything about uh, zombies before. I had to do read now. up. Mm -hmm. I do now. Uh, I read World War Z. I saw a zombie movie. Zom what's it called? Zombie Land. Woody Harrelson's movie. I, I studied, but I almost think that what I'm shooting for in language, at least in this genre is um, something that devotees of zombie literature will recognize to a certain extent with a thin patina of Spanish culture. Not too much, but enough so that they say, oh, I can travel to another country and still read about my favorite thing, zombies. So in, in the case at least of uh, genre fiction, 
there is an expectation on the part of the reader that I'll be under, I'll be fo able to follow this story. It won't be too far out, and yet I get a little extra value along with it. So the language isn't exactly the same from the Spanish sensibility to English, of course, obviously, an American English at that. But um, there's a certain assumption about what you're going to get when you do a zombie book or one like it. But you, you also, I mean, to go back to your question originally, you have to have an ear for what's happening in the writing yes. anyway. I mean, this is, this is a big part of your job. Whether it's easy, whether it's complex, whether the texture is like this or the texture is like that, a large part of your job is getting a sense of that and then, as John said, being able to replicate that in the original. I think you can't be a translator unless you have a sense of, of that thing, which might be music and it might be flavor. I mean, there are, however you want to describe it. Um, because obviously there are lots of books which if you were to translate them into a nice, fluent, easy English, it would be completely inappropriate translation because it wasn't a nice, fluent, original Polish, Turkish, German, or Greek. But I think you have to have an ear for it, whatever kind of book it is. That's, that's the, the, first, the first most important thing. Esther, I'm curious about how you teach these things. Well, um, yes, I actually don't offer a class on translating bestsellers. <laughs> maybe, well, you know, maybe I will have to do this. But no, I mean, so I think that, that to been. what, uh, to what uh, right, you were saying, uh, it, one of the interesting things about bestsellers is that there is a kind of international language of bestseller done for certain books, for detective novels, for thrillers, for zombie books. And, and a lot of this stuff emanates out of English. So what I tell my students when I take them through a course where we translate, German, uh, we translate journalism, we translate diplomacy, we translate scientific text, we translate, I say don't try to translate a, a kind of text you've never read. If you're going to be translating uh, an inter a, a thriller into English, read a lot of thrillers in English so that you understand the rhythm, the pacing, the kinds of sentences, because these, these aren't books that necessarily are seeking to be particularly original. They're seeking to, you know, touch on pleasure centers that are well established and that look for certain things, and all you have to do is gratify those things which are formulaic. So if you're dealing with formulaic writing, know the formula and read books that are written in that formula so that you can handle the formula as well. Have you had, I, I've had publishers say very specifically, they've given me a Spanish novel and said, Ken Follett is basically what we want it to end up like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This might actually mean, you know, if there are certain things you're going to change, like make the sentences shorter or longer or whatever, but that is, that is the kind of bestseller we want it to be. And they decide, I mean, they decide that something is going to be a bestseller in a sense. How do you I feel about to, that? Can I say one more thing yeah. here? Oh yeah, what does he think? Um, I also want to say though that uh, Manel Loredo, the Spanish author, <coughs> writes very well. I don't know, I don't want to say that he is a formulaic writer because it isn't a typical zombie book as far as I can tell. He ha his character is different, he's appealing, he's sort of a milk toast at the beginning and then he becomes kind of a warrior at the end of the trilogy to survive, and the writing is thoughtful and a bit philosophical. In fact, some of the Amazon blogs haven't liked that, the, that he's too emotional sometimes, but he is unusual in that I think he has passion, maybe, and not just a slasher, I don't know what. But the, the, um, the thing that I had to do was get rid of my prejudice about um, pulp fiction and consider it something that was really important to the in initial author, to M Manel Loledo, because he cared about his writing and it's decently written, and I had to honor that the way I would any novel, no matter how serious on the other end of the spectrum it is. And so I, I did want to sort of put that in there. It's not just a formula, but I had to know the formula to go ahead. Yeah. And one thing I'd just like to add to that is, of course, best-selling writers can still produce quality prose. Um, I think we're making a distinction here between genre fiction, which can also be good, good writing, but some which also is more popular writing, and those books which have just sold very well because they're very good books, you know. Um, and a distinction must be made then when one's translating them as to how you're going to go about <clears throat> attacking uh, the translation.
I really like the emphasis on the root there of being familiar with the material, uh, both the source material and also the target genre, mm -hmm. the target readership. Uh, thinking about anything that you set out to do, the research is obviously elemental. And that leads to a question. A number of the bestsellers that we're talking about here today, I guess two of them are historical novels. And I'm curious, uh, because as a reader, coming from an American perspective, my history is uh, less than well established when it comes to European history and the details of World War II and who thought what. And thinking about a novel written by a Turk or a novel written by a Spaniard that was written about that same period in history, they have the same level of awareness of their history as I would if it was based on the American Civil War. And I'm curious, as a translator, how that gap in historical understanding for your readership versus the, the original language readership uh, comes into your work. Well, I have to answer your question in a slightly indirect way. I recently translated a book about Theodora. Theodora was a Byzantine empress who lived in the sixth century. She was an extremely beautiful dancer and a stripper and a whore. And uh, Justinian, the Byzantine emperor, saw her dancing, fell in love with her and married her. And she goes down in history as the, one of the greatest empresses on earth in history. Now, the person who wrote the book, the author in Turkey, is a professor of history. So although he had all his facts right, and he had written a very beautifully um, written um, page turner, there was no spice in it at all. It was very, very dry. So I had to say to him, look, it's a fascinating story, beautifully written. I will do my best to translate this. But we, do you mind if we spice it up a little? He said, what do you mean by spice it up? <laughs> well, I said, Justinian, the, uh, the, the um, emperor, um, the first night they are together, he takes her in his arms and he takes her to his bedroom, end of chapter. I said, this is Theodora. <laughs> Theodora, uh, uh, a hooker, a whore. She, was, she made men mad about her and you're going to leave the chapter there? You know, I mean, for God's sake, we've got... Th um, shades of uh, Fifty Shades of Grey and whatever, and you are ending it like a hundred years ago. He said, okay, write it, I'll read it, and if I agree with it, we'll add it to the Turkish as well. Excellent. Need I add, say more. He has added it to the Turkish. <laughs> uh, Danny, did you have something to contribute about history? It was interesting that this this novel, which which uh, we're, we're talking about, I translated the Spanish novel, which is set around the time of the Spanish Civil War, and the reviews of it, and the the uh, as it were amateur mm. reviews, the kind of Amazon reviews, about half of them said the ones that didn't like it, a lot of them didn't like it because there's all this historical stuff, <laughs> there's all this stuff about people we've never heard of, and the ones that really liked it, really liked it because there was all this historical stuff, yeah. and it's great because you get to learn about a place and the people, etc., etc. Et the good historical novels, whether it's about a place you, in a time you know or not, are good for some other reason as well, whether it's because there is a really good sex scene which has been added by the translator, <laughs> or because of the character or the something that is driving the prose, whatever it is. Um, it should be possible to read a great historical novel uh, for some other reason and not massively care if you don't know all of the details. That's not to say that as a translator we can't sneak in helpful little bits of information. But this is true whether it's a bestseller or not, whether it's in a sense a historical book or not. We are always, or at least I am always, and I hope that people aren't going to shake their heads next to me. I'm always finding myself in a position where I feel I have to maybe smuggle in a little piece yeah. of information where if a character is referred to in, a, in a, this book as Franco, if I'm translating for a place where I don't assume that people will know who Franco is, where absolutely every one of the original readers would know, I might say General Franco. 
I'm not going to put a footnote. I'm not going to say Franco, who, by the way, <laughs> let me tell you a few things about yeah. him. But you smuggle in little bits of information. If there is a name of a, some kind of stew that people are eating, you say such and such stew. And then you, you hide this little bit of information. And so people manage to get a, a, fair, a much closer access to the kind of experience of the original reader. But that's the kind of thing which I think you mm. smuggle in if you're talking about, mm. if you assume there's going to be a really big discrepancy between yeah. what the original readers will know and what the new readers will know, if that actually matters. Yeah. A lot of the time, the things that the original readers know, you don't need, you ignore them. Can, can I just add something to that? Because uh, I do exactly the same thing whenever, whenever possible. But there's another point to be made here, is one can't always assume that every cultural and historical reference made in an original book, and in, in, in my case this is books written in German, are known by all the readers in Germany, Austria, or Switzerland themselves. There's a very interesting example happened <coughs> with the book I'm translating at the moment about uh, the satire, Scenes Through the Eyes of Adolf Hitler. There was a long television program about it in Germany while I was over there recently, <coughs> and at the end of which, they interviewed a number of students on the street, asking them about the, uh, their knowledge of a number of figures in the Third Reich. And it was extraordinary just how little, how ignorant a lot of these Germans were about people like Martin Bormann or even Goebbels. You know, not everybody had even heard of Goebbels. So one can't assume that English readers are going to be losing something that all the German readers will have got. The, f the first book I... The first book I wrote was published in the UK and then in the US. The American publishers sent me a note, I remember, saying we may have to reframe the opening of Chapter 7 because a lot of American readers, and this was in a, in a slightly kind of apologetic way, won't know who John Hunter is. To which I said, and I'm assuming there are some people in this room who will be reassured to know this, most English readers aren't going to know who John Hunter is either. But the assumption is somehow that yeah. this was written for an, an all-knowing audience to begin with, and therefore we have somehow to compensate, and the readers are going to want everything explained, and if not, they're somehow going to panic. Mm. Or you get to you know page 79, and you go, there's a name I don't know, and I'm, I'm going to... It's, it's monstrous. Yeah. No, people, people cope. I look up, when I read a book and I don't know a name, I look it up. You know, simple as that. Yeah. Or something, I look it up, I find out. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Well, in, in, especially in the era of Google, right? I mean, it's so easy to look things up. Um, but uh, just to, as a footnote to what you were saying, both of you, and, and uh, to try and turn my mind away from the image of the Empress Theodora, that, uh, <laughs> that I, I was really all I wanted to go. That's not just where I want to go right now. Um, uh, Susan Bernofsky, who's, who's sitting over there, and I have edited a collection of essays by translators with support from Amazon, hence I'm plugging it here. And uh, there's an essay in there by a man named Jason Grunebaum who translates from the Hindi. And um, it, there's a really interesting uh, bit about how he doesn't call it smuggling in, Danny, because I don't think it's smuggling in if it's a piece of information that is absolutely there within the word for the original reader. The original reader just doesn't need General Franco because the original reader, General is there as part of the word yes, for the original kind of reader. Translating it from the culture rather yeah. than translating it from the word. So Jason, who translates from the Hindi, has all these mentions of these holidays that any reader in the Hindi knows exactly the, all of the specifics of these very intricate Indian holidays. If this were a 19th century text, if it was Emile Zola and he were a, an academic translator from the French, he would put a footnote. But um, a contemporary English translation practice for any contemporary literature, not just bestsellers, but any novel, even a very high literary novel, absolutely eschews the use of footnotes for uh, you know a, a translated piece of fiction. So what Jason does is simply explains the Hindu holiday for his readers who are just not going to know anything about it and who need to understand it in order to follow what comes in the novel. If they didn't need to understand it, I think he could just leave it and somebody could Google it if they really wanted to know. So again, it's kind of a case-by-case -case basis, but the point is we never use footnotes in translating, although in other in other places they do. In, in, in Russian, for example, I believe that the translation of contemporary fiction is quite often accompanied by extensive footnotes by the translator. But English usage just doesn't accept that. So, um, Is it time Gabrielle. for us to be wrapping up? Are you in I charge? Just, just one more thing to yeah. add to that. Uh, the rule of thumb, I think we've all agreed, is if the information advances the story, and you could ignore it if it really isn't necessary. There's a third kind of, of information, sort of, 
that appears in this book, and I've seen it in other books, and that is where the original um, audience didn't have a prejudice or uh, weren't affected by some stray comment that we in English would be. And the example is this, uh, is this that in the book they talk about this wasteland that's inhabited only by zombies, and they call it the Wild West. Okay? But then they talk about all the zombies they've killed, and they call them dead Indians and dead Apaches. And I couldn't do that. I couldn't leave that, or I couldn't in any novel, but I certainly couldn't leave it in a book that a lot of Americans are going to read. Maybe I'm too PC, so I changed it to another Wild West term. I call them varmints, which isn't quite right. But I just, don't, I just couldn't leave it dead Indians, so I'm too offensive. Not to leave us all with images of dead Indians <laughs> and uh, uh, horror baronesses, <laughs> but I would love to open the floor to some questions before we have to leave the stage. I see one in the back already. Go ahead, sir. Is there a microphone going around, or should he just... Yeah, maybe you yeah, can just wait, speak... Wait for my turn. Here it is. Oh, there she is. Sorry, I caught you off guard. Thanks. Um, it's about footnotes and e-reading, and I'm quite accustomed now with my Kindle to to click on a word and have a dictionary definition. I just wondered if that's something, uh, as translators, you're being drawn into or see opportunities in. Yes. <laughs> it was something, actually, we discussed when we were, uh, when I was in Germany recently and I was talking about the Hitler book I'm translating, it was, it was a workshop where I was there with 11 other translators and the author for a week. And the Italian and Spanish translators were making the publisher, the original publisher, pull her hair out because they were planning endless footnotes and glossaries and 900 other pages based on all these things. But we did see that in electronic editions, that kind of thing might be much easier. In the digital book market, that kind of, you know, it's less intrusive than it is in, 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 in published works. So that may be something that be more common in the future. But that's, but that's about everything, not just translations, yeah. I think. Yeah. Because I think the, the mode of reading becomes slightly different. Yeah. I think one of the reasons we don't like footnotes in translations is because we don't like footnotes in novels. I mean, I think if I read a contemporary British novel which had footnotes explaining national holidays, that would irritate me as well. <laughs> the reason yeah, I don't like... Wallace gets a, a free card. Yes, this is a problem. Um, <laughs> yes, the, the way I read English novels, the way I read translated novels is sort of the same, and things that annoy me in one and annoy me in the other. So I think the opportunities are also the same, that because we'll start thinking about what you can do with a piece of writing in English, regardless of whether the English is the original incarnation or not. What we can do, what the technology allows us to do as, as consumers of that, that will change regardless of, of where this English started. Yeah. Back to the question of royalties. Uh, we have a, someone who's translated for Amazon. That's right. Is it okay now? Yeah. Sorry. Um, on the question of royalties, there's a translator here who's done a book for Amazon Crossing. And I have heard that Amazon Crossing have unusual structures for paying translators involving much larger than usual royalties. So the translator, as it were, takes a risk along with the publisher. Can you tell us anything about your <laughs> deal with them? I can Thanks. take this one since yeah, I'm ahead. the editor oh, yeah, for Amazon yeah, Crossing. Yeah. Uh, we, we are experimenting with the ways to pay translators, and right now our, stra our structure is generally a fee, which is not an advance against future royalties. It's just a flat fee that we pay uh, when the work is done, and then royalties that start paying on the first sale. So, and they are higher than the half percent or the one percent, but it's negotiable by the book, so it'll vary based on the translator and the project and what the fee turns out to be. Uh, things like timelines are a factor too. So what we're trying to do is get many translators working, many books published in translation, and there's a lot of ways to go about doing that. So I, I think that the, the real goal is to get translators paid regularly so they can keep translating. Uh, and if they should intelligently choose a book that did well in its original language and that tra they translate beautifully and that does well in English, they be begin to benefit uh, the same day we do. Thank you. Yeah, how did you start in the translation industry? How did you get your first book? <laughs> I was a graduate student. It was a project for my MFA in creative writing. And I found the author when I was looking in a 
foreign bookstore in uh, Miami, and there she was, and that was what it was for me. Mine was a sample for a translator, uh, for a publishing house. I think there's a lot of luck. Yeah, yeah. and a lot of luck. Uh, luck, and, luck and, and yes, it's an accident. Um, which is either a good thing or a bad thing, depending on. Um, I was asked by a friend to read a book to tell her if it was any good because it was in Portuguese and she doesn't read Portuguese. And I said, yes, this is wonderful. You should publish it. And then she said, do you want to translate it? And I said, yes. Okay. Having no intention of being a translator and what the hell was I thinking? And I then had one of those kind of next morning, yes? What do you mean, yes? Um, because there, there seemed only kind of in retrospect it seemed extraordinarily heuristic to say I think this is a magnificent book and simultaneously I could write this um, but this friend then persuaded me that it, that it would, wouldn't be such a bad idea and probably while we're on the subject probably no one's going to read it anyway so that was okay so I did that for her and then and, and now look well um, in my case uh, I was working for the foreign office all my life I was an interpreter and when I retired, I went to live in Turkey and uh, I decided to write a couple of plays and I was extremely lucky. One of them was very successful. So Aisha Kulin put two and two together. She thought if I could write a play in Turkish, I could maybe translate from Turkish to English. And uh, cutting a very long story short, she met me and she asked me about Kuzum, my lamb, and then I ended up translating her books. So talk to your favorite authors. <laughs> Anybody else? Maybe one more question and wrap up. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah, now. Okay. I was wondering if, there's, if you feel more pressure when there's a best-selling novel to be translated, <laughs> not just from the publisher, but also from the public, the reading public if there's a lot of publicity around a novel, is that changing the way you translate? So, um, a big yes, because uh, not really because of the publisher, Amazon Crossing was very supportive, and we just decided together, it was a group, a group decision, that we wanted something that would be a good read in English. But the pressure in the case of this it comes from the Amazon blog, and all the readers who tell me just exactly what they think of everything I'm doing, every down, every paragraph and word choice, and most of it's good, but some of it's kind of off-putting. And the pressure I have, because many of those avid readers have tracked me down after the first book, I don't know how they found me, but they did, and they were exhorting me to hurry up with that second book, and some of it was kind of creepy. So. I did have some uh, pressure from the readership. Not so much from Amazon. Can I just say, not normally, but with the one I'm doing at the moment, yes, huge amounts of pressure. Because it's already been written about in the British press over a year before we're actually publishing it here. Um, so the expectations, because I think a, a large uh, um, contingent in the press wants to have a go at this book even before it's appeared in English. So I think the, the pressure will be there to make sure it doesn't fail. Those are both, in a sense, unusual cases because, for the most part, things that are bestsellers, no one anticipates. Um, even something which is a massive bestseller in Spain, the British reading public is not going to be, you know, eagerly, you know, queuing around the block of Waterstones at midnight for the, 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 to get the first copy. The sense of anticipation is usually fairly muted, to say the least. Um, the, the, the case um, which, which Pam mentioned is unusual because what does happen is if you start having, for example, a series, in exactly the same way that if you're the author of a series, you then start having a public who is waiting for it and who is eager. Yeah. The pressure from the publisher can only be different in one sense, which is if it's a publisher who has certain expectation to its invested money in a particular kind of way, who has, uh, who has, who has yes, has expectations which you then have a certain responsibility for delivering. I just wanted to also add that I, I had to audition for this book. It's the Amazon Crossing Way. And so by the time I was finished working with that particular editor through the auditioning process, and I don't know how many people were also, also auditioning, she never told me, 
But I, I knew I could work with them very well by the end of that process. I knew that I could deliver, and they knew I could deliver what they wanted and what I was willing to do. And there really wasn't a lot of confusion from them or, or pressure. So it was a nice process, actually. I think we uh, are probably out of time. Are you going to take one more question? Yeah. Thanks. Does that, does that work? Yeah. No. We've heard little snippet, snippets about how you work with Amazon Crossing. For somebody who is an editor there, could you just very briefly go through the various stages of how it works? Yeah, I was tempted to after the auditioning comment. Thanks for giving me a reason to. Um, so the, the audition that Pam describes is a process where the translators uh, see projects that I'm seeking a perfect translator for in a marketplace environment and are requested to place a bid. And what that includes is a timeline that you could commit to a fee that you would be comfortable with, and a royalty that you would be comfortable with, and a short snippet translation of a piece of the book. So the goal there is for us to have something to share with our authors to say this is the translator we're matching you with and this is why. A lot of translator matchmaking over time has been very much based on who you know and how you found them and if the author brought someone along with them or if the agent suggested someone. And uh, Amazon Crossing is doing about 30 books a year, which is a lot of people for me to personally know. I have a lot of translators in my Rolodex, but not quite that many. Um, and the books come from different languages, and the process is not very democratic in the traditional approach. Um, there's not necessarily going to be a perfect match in voice. And when you think about it, if you have three translators, each of whom has gotten excited about the book and translated a short snippet, which really doesn't take a huge amount of time. It's, it's maybe a 45 minute work. Um, you've invested something to show us what you think you can do. And we have something then to show to our authors and to our agents who we're working with to make them feel really comfortable with the decision we're about to make. Uh, and I think that that opportunity actually is very inclusive for new translators. And it's very eye-opening to me because a lot of the things that I would base on a resume and a book that I had read years ago that I thought was beautifully translated doesn't necessarily reference the book that I'm looking to publish today. So the, the whole goal of the process is to sort of open that up and to give a little bit more of a chance to the translator to consider the work before they decide to work on it. I've had a number of translators be excited about projects and then choose not to bid because they got started on a paragraph and thought, I don't want to do this. Uh, and that exercise is really helpful because you don't want to sign a contract and then get neck deep in something you don't want to do. Uh, and it also means that we end up with timing, pricing, and quality of the translation that everyone can agree to, uh, which is incredible for me as a, trans as a translation coordinator. It, it really simplifies and makes much more clear to those involved the process. Thank you so much for taking the time to come and join us today, and thank you so much to our lovely translators. Uh, if you haven't read any of the books that we're talking about here today, I highly, re highly recommend that you do. Uh, and one of the hard things to do is keep track of who's translated what, uh, but if you do search our translators' names on Amazon in any country, you'll find their works that they've worked on as well, and that's a great way to get to know what people have been up to. So thank you very much.